In a land of mighty rivers, lazy bayous, woodlands, wetlands, and underwater gardens, the bounty of nature comes alive in America's Delta. Species that have survived for millennia are rapidly slipping into extinction, with consequences scientists are just beginning to comprehend. Meet a few of these remarkable creatures. They're a huge mystery. And those fighting for their recovery. Once they're gone, then they're gone and we'll never have them back. Witness new discoveries. This is actually history in the making. Inspiring successes. And the extraordinary effort to save this life on the edge. This program was made possible by the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, keeping our wildlife resources healthy for future generations. Wildlife matters. And by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. As civilizations flourish, the animal kingdom fades ever further from view. Worldwide, more than 800 animal species have become extinct. Dozens now exist only in captivity. Nearly 10,000 are endangered, and thousands more are at risk. Louisiana is home to over 600 species of rare plants and animals, and nearly 40% of the wetlands in the continental United States. From longleaf forests to the Gulf of Mexico's sandy shores, this diverse region once hosted a seemingly endless array of wildlife. Today, it remains a haven for thousands of species, but many are on the edge of extinction, devastated by habitat loss and human disruption. New technology is enabling scientists to better understand their plight and how their survival is inextricably tied to our own. As many as 100,000 nesting pairs of bald eagles soared the nation's skies when they were adopted as our national bird in 1782. Less than two centuries later, only about 400 remained. Decimated by habitat destruction, overhunting, and residual poisoning from pesticides. So this is a uh, adult bald eagle that was found in Plaquemines yeah, Parish in somebody's yard. Uh, she was very thin and uh, emaciated when she came in and we had her uh, stabilized uh, over the weekend to make sure she was strong enough to tolerate the anesthesia. Anesthesia can be pretty rough on, on bald eagles. These powerful birds have a wingspan of six to eight feet, weigh up to 14 pounds, and can live up to 25 years in the wild. Bald eagles usually made for life and spend years upgrading their homes. Their nests are gigantic. The biggest bird nest on the planet, built by a single bird species. They can weigh more than a car or more than a couple of cars. They, they get so heavy over time. Bald eagles usually lay one to three eggs per year. Eaglets grow quickly and fly off on their own at about four months old. Approximately 70% survive their first year of life. But scientists estimate only one in 10 make it to adulthood or five years of age. There's signs that she was shot at one point and she has a little pellet they're trying to remove right now. In 1940, Congress passed the Bald Eagle Protection Act, prohibiting the killing, selling, or possessing of the species and their nests. But even today, those threats remain. That we have a set of tests and things that we do on every bald eagle that comes through, it gets done the same way. Uh, and then we've been gathering that data over the years with the hopes that you know, we can learn a little bit more about their diseases and, and toxicities is the big one. In 1972, the EPA banned DDT and other pesticides that bioaccumulated in fish, causing reproductive failure for several bird species. The government was seeing that we have all these threats to these species, they're declining, they're going extinct, and then we need to do something. The following year, the federal government took another historic step, passing the Endangered Species Act, America's strongest environmental law. 99% of the approximately 1,500 species under its care have since escaped extinction. The Endangered Species Act that we know today was passed in 1973 to help conserve the ecosystems upon which federally listed species, threatened and endangered species, depend, but also implement protection and recovery for those species. In 1978, 
The American bald eagle made the list. We were very close to losing bald eagle. Endangered throughout most of the country, their survival, like this eagle's, was on the line. Endangered means a species is in danger of becoming extinct throughout all or a significant portion of its range. And a threatened species is one that is threatened with becoming endangered throughout all or a significant portion of its range. Then we have candidate species, which are species that we know need to be listed. From the symbol of our nation's freedom soaring high above to a little known snake slithering below, this complex web of life is not yet fully understood. But an army of great minds and passionate individuals are joining forces to figure it out and try to save even the most elusive of these imperiled creatures. The Louisiana pine snake uh, has been, been called by some one of the rarest vertebrates in North America. It's currently a candidate uh, for the federal list of endangered species. Few would be willing to stick their hands in a snake-filled trap, but for zoologist Bo Gregory from the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, it's just another day at the office. I would definitely take a, a snake bite over um, doing paperwork. He's part of a dedicated group of experts working overtime to save these reclusive reptiles. When we started working on this species in 1993, there were only about 60 known records of the species. And our really only method to date of estimating populations is trap success, which has some problems. Louisiana pine snakes spend more than half their lives underground. Biologists install strategically located drift fences, snake traps, and microchip readers in Kisatchee National Forest, Fort Polk, and Bienville Parish and monitor them weekly from April to October in hopes of finding these rare snakes. You have the zoos that are involved that are raising the snakes. We have partnerships with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries, which help with a lot of the management of the species. But it just happens to be our piece of land, the Catahoula District, that was chosen for the reintroduction site. But it is a, a massive project with lots of different uh, partners. An expert trapper for over 13 years, Gregory's only found about 20 or so in the wild. Still, each trap holds hope. Pine snake. Oh, two pine snakes. That doesn't happen every day. Oh man, that's, that's great. Oh, this is a fat one. That's what I like to see. So he's definitely over, over, well over four feet. But as you can see, he's not um, being aggressive at all. And they're really, pine snakes will rarely attempt to bite. I mean, I take data from them, uh, measurements, uh, determine the gender, those sorts of things. We'll draw blood, we'll insert a pit tag, which is a um, microchip very similar to what you would put in the neck of your pet that can be scanned with a, a piece of equipment and it'll give us a unique number for each uh, snake and that, that way we know we've captured it before. To my knowledge, two Louisiana pine snakes have never been been captured in the trap at the, at the same time, so this is actually history in the making. Only about 215 are currently known to science and a consortium of zoos, led by Memphis Zoo, is playing a critical role in helping to repopulate the species. Well, here at the Audubon Zoo, as part of the Audubon Nature Institute, we uh, are propagating these animals for release. It's the largest snake in Louisiana, lays the largest eggs in North America, and it eats primarily gophers in the wild. Here in captivity, however, dead mice will have to do. The Louisiana pine snake program has been in existence with a captive population for, I believe, 10 years. We have no idea what happens to the eggs in the wild. I don't, I'm not sure that anybody's actually found a wild clutch of Louisiana pine snake eggs. They're a huge mystery. But with the help of new research and technology, a clearer picture is beginning to emerge. Louisiana pine snakes generally lay between one to seven eggs in captivity. 
They usually hatch in isolation and total darkness. Rarely, if ever, has a full hatching been witnessed. But thanks to David Heckard and our camera crew, wildlife biologists can see it for the first time along with us. When they do hatch, they slit the egg and they sit there with their head poking out and they uh, absorb some more yolk. Their umbilicus closes up and then after a period of time that only that snake knows, but generally about 24 to 30 hours, they crawl out and they go coral up. At uh, 80 degrees, it takes them about 70 days to hatch, plus or minus five days. It's, you never know when they're gonna come out. It's all related to things that we can't necessarily predict or control. They usually range from four to five feet in length. They lay eggs as big as baked potatoes and produce the largest hatchlings of any North American snake. Without a doubt, my favorite part of the job and hopefully everybody involved with this project is releasing these snakes back into the wild. The following spring, program partners meet at Kasachi National Forest to bring these captive bred snakes home. Over the last three years, we've released a total of, I believe, 29 snakes. We're releasing an additional 14 today. And it seems to be working. Do you have your data? But it's got to be trunk. a new okay. detection. It's yeah, it's going to be a, a, it's gonna be a new detection. Nothing from today. Oh, it's fantastic. We'll have the data, and we'll be able to see whether it's been a year or two years. And um, we had a, a, a snake that had lived for two years and that we had released as a one-year-old snake, and then we had a snake that um, we released as a baby snake, and it had also lived for two years. So it makes it all worthwhile. It's a lot of work, but it makes it all worthwhile to actually see that everything is working and the snakes are surviving out here. The Louisiana pine snake is an inhabitant of pine uh, forests on sandy, well-drained soils that are burned very frequently, which was the natural regime uh, 100 years ago. Uh, fire suppression by uh, various land ag agencies and landowners has resulted in massive changes to the ecosystem and the type of habitat you see behind me is very rare now. Historically, Louisiana pine snakes lived in longleaf pine forests in western Louisiana and eastern Texas. By 1935, about 97% of these old growth forests had been harvested by the timber industry. The biggest problem for the species is probably habitat destruction. The main thing is that we have got to improve the quality of habitat that's out there or they're not going to make it. And it's, it's the same way with all the other species that we deal with. The number one threat is habitat loss. Prescribed burns, like this one at Sandy Hollow Wildlife Management Area, are part of ongoing efforts to restore these fragile pine savannas for the hundreds of species that rely on them. If you take the um, fire out of the system, it's going to totally change into um, hardwoods. You know, you're not gonna get any light on the ground, uh, and then you eventually you'll have uh, no grass, and, and those are the sorts of things that the quail and the tortoise need. Um, and, and not just those species, there are other rare species, um, Bachman sparrows, um, really just everything here is adapted to fire. And so you've got to have fire in this system or you're going to lose those animals that, that are uh, supposed to be here. Animals like the gopher tortoise. Federally threatened here in Louisiana, biologists believe only about 300 of these charismatic creatures remain in parts of Washington, St. Tammany, and Tangipahoa parishes. Carrie Landry from the Louisiana Natural Heritage Program is conducting burrow counts to assess the state's population. Gopher tortoises spend most of their lives in their extraordinary burrows that can range up to 50 feet long and 10 feet deep. These underground tunnels provide homes to over 360 species. Everything from snakes to small mammals, lizards, frogs, there's many different species that use their burrows and some of these species rely primarily and almost exclusively on the gopher tortoise burrows. Without the gopher tortoise, many other species uh, would be in jeopardy. Oh, that's really cool. That's their defense display, where they'll start bobbing their head when they feel threatened. Harming or possessing gopher tortoises is illegal, but sometimes people unwittingly try to help them and take them in as pets. 
A call to the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries can help coordinate their care through wildlife rehabilitators or local zoos and assure they're released into suitable habitat. They have charming winning personalities and they're often kept along with box turtles in suburban backyards. They may have initials carved in them, they may be spray painted, they may have holes drilled in their shells so that all kinds of things are done to them for one reason or another. Many also suffer from respiratory and other diseases. Often it takes months to rehabilitate these animals and coordinate their release, which is a costly and difficult process for already overburdened wildlife agencies. And finding them a good home provides its own set of challenges. Tortoises, they require a very specialized habitat, and often when you identify that habitat, it's on private property. Restoration efforts like these at Sandy Hollow are vital, but more than 80% of Louisiana is privately owned, so partnering with landowners is key for the survival of this and countless other species. We have some grant money to work with landowners to get improvements in tortoise habitat so that the tortoises can kind of move in off the right-of-ways back into these habitats that they were found in and start reproducing, because otherwise we're gonna lose them. In a couple decades, they'll be gone. A lot of our time is spent on the road traveling from uh, site to site. We have a big adult female that we're releasing today. There's currently a male gopher tortoise that's in the pen right now. Hopefully all this will go well and she'll take to it pretty good and um, maybe we'll do a little matchmaking. They'll like each other. This two acre pen was constructed to house these rehabilitated animals. They have an unstoppable homing instinct. Without this barrier, they might wander until their death, searching for their homes. If you built a house yourself, you know, it takes a lot of energy and a lot of time, and so you're going to want to stay in that house. And so what happens uh, when you take them from the wild and then you have to put them back out somewhere else where they're not from, they basically want to find their home again, and so they wander on and on and on. Gopher tortoises grow up to 15 inches long and weigh 8 to 15 pounds. They eat primarily herbaceous vegetation. They are really good seed dispersers. So they are really instrumental in spreading seed from all of these plants and helping to keep the ground cover intact. While they can live up to 100 years in captivity, they don't reach maturity until they're 10 to 20 years old and have a low reproductive rate. Only three to five percent of their young typically survive, most falling victim to predators. What we have now is a lot of older tortoises that are not reproducing because the habitat is not suitable. So basically they're persisting and then over the years they'll die out and we won't have any recruitment. The only site in the state that we have reproduction is on Sandy Hollow Wildlife Management Area and that's it. Many species, abundant for millennia, are now facing extinction primarily due to human influence. The American alligator has survived for 200 million years. But by the 1960s, unregulated hunting reduced populations so drastically that some believed they would never recover. Wild alligator numbers had gotten so low, wildlife and fisheries uh, had closed the season for, oh, I think it was like 10, 15 years. And during that time, they developed a program to uh, allow people to harvest alligators to fuel that market. I'm Ted Faungu. My brother and I, as a sideline job, uh, started an alligator business about 25 years ago. We're still in it, still doing it, still have all of our appendages. The Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries Sustained Use Program now serves as a model for managing crocodilian species around the world one that is not only self-sustaining, but quite lucrative. If you look at just the first sales of alligator skins and meat, that generates about 60 to $70 million per year today into Louisiana's economy. We've got about a six or seven foot. The idea is gonna to be to get him to come to the top as quietly as we can without, without any fighting, so we can shoot him as quick as possible, get him loaded and move on to the next line. Now we got to cut a slit in his tail so that we can tag him. 
Alligator hunters like Russell Bourgeois secure a license from Wildlife and Fisheries and permission from landowners to hunt on their property. Serial number tags are issued to regulate kills and track biological data and revenue. From an alligator forming a ranching standpoint, you do a similar thing except instead of applying for the right to harvest an alligator, you're applying for the right to harvest an alligator egg on an individual's uh, privately owned wetlands. You watch for that mama now. I will. You can't rotate the egg. If you rotate it, you'll kill it. So you got to deal with that. You got to deal with this 100 degree weather. About half the time there's a fire ant nest in the nest here. We assess alligator populations and then determine an egg harvest quota for each given landowner's property. Mama doesn't realize it, but we're enhancing the population because normally only about six to eight percent of those eggs would survive to a four foot alligator. They bring those alligator eggs into captivity, they incubate them, raise them to a marketable size, and then they have to release 12% of what they raise back to the wild to be able to maintain our wild alligator population. Delisted in Louisiana in 1981, alligators were removed from the federal endangered species list throughout their entire range in 1987. Now it's a highly regulated business. The wild season, as well as farming, is uh, strictly managed by wildlife and fisheries to ensure that the um, sustainability of, of the alligator. Since the program's inception in 1972, nearly 940,000 wild alligators, 8 million eggs, and 5 million farm-raised alligators have been harvested and sold, generating millions of dollars in direct revenue to landowners, trappers, and farmers and over a billion dollars to the state. You know, the alligator industry is one of the very few that pretty much totally pays for itself. We pay a tag fee for every tag that goes on the alligators. That goes towards a sustaining department in wildlife and fisheries that manages the alligators. It goes towards research. You know, proof is in the pudding. It has worked very well. Thanks to Herculean efforts by state and federal wildlife agencies, nonprofits, and private citizens, many vulnerable species are on their way back from the brink, and innovative research is underway to track their progress. Here, outside of Morgan City, under the cover of darkness, researchers set a trap and lay in wait to catch a bald eagle. As noon approaches, they're about to give up, when suddenly, two eagles take the bait. We we'll take general measurements on the birds, put a transmitter on them, and then release them and find out where they go from the transmitter. Delisted in 2007, bald eagles are now thriving once more throughout North America. Within our state, there was about a seven to eight uh, year doubling for the last 30 years uh, for bald eagles. Now, new solar-powered transmitters and telemetry are enabling scientists to track eagles' migration routes and nesting patterns in real time. And the results are rather surprising. We first started marking birds back in the spring of 2012, and so we have currently nine operational transmitters working on eagles. And so we're able to track the birds, follow their migration, see where they're ending up. So far, all our birds flew north up into Canada and stayed about one to four months, turned around and came all the way back to Louisiana, traveled about 1,600 miles on their way. Today, a burgeoning ecotourism industry draws bird watchers from around the world to admire these resilient raptors and the unique wildlife that still abounds here. People come from all over the country to see our bald eagles. You know, living in a cypress swamp, that, in trees that are 80 to 100 years old. And those areas will continue to be protected because of the eagle's presence there. All species and their habitats rely not just on nature for their survival, but on mankind. And although we might not yet fully understand how, we are just as reliant on them. 
The thing about nature and the environment is they're not making any more of it. We're losing it at a rapid pace. We've got to have clean water. We've got to have clean air, food resources, and those sorts of things. You know, everything is so tied together, no matter how insignificant it may seem. And as we start losing species, who knows when it's going to collapse? You know, you can't, can't keep taking uh, integral parts uh, from a functioning system and expect it to continue functioning. You may not see it directly impact you, but we don't live isolated. We live in a, in a, a big world where many, many things are interconnected and we're learning more and more every day how interconnected things are. It's hard when you believe so much in something and you go outside and you see the beauty and you see the um, wonder of it all. And it's hard to say, I don't want to keep it for other people. But what do you think people would pay if we knew that tonight was the last sunset you would ever see. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. This program was made possible by the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, keeping our wildlife resources healthy for future generations. Wildlife matters. And by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.